You'll note the red on the altar and the pulpit, which indicates that today is a special day, a saint day. It's uh, a day to commemorate Saint Mark the Evangelist. So today we will pray our opening prayer, focusing on Saint Mark. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have enriched your church with Mark's proclamation of the gospel. Give us grace to believe firmly in the good news of salvation and to walk daily in accord with it through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be seated, please. For text today, I've chosen portions of the beginning and the conclusion of Mark's gospel, since it is Mark the Evangelist that we commemorate today. First section would come from Mark's reporting of the calling of that first group of apostles. And passing along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of all people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going a little further, he saw James, the son of Jebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat and the hired servants and followed him. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes. 
And at the other end of this bookend of Mark, we find a remarkable story because the first story celebrates the prominent role of the 12 men who were called. And at the end, we find a strange paradox that the apostles, those who bear the words of the risen Lord, are women. And now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went out and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they had heard that he was alive and had seen by her, they would not believe it. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them either. May the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. As I pondered Mark the Evangelist and what little we can determine about his life, I was struck by two very important themes. One theme that seems to mark what we know of Mark's biography, and you will hear me use Mark by Mark quite frequently, is that he seemed actively to seek out people who would challenge him. First, history shows us that he was a compatriot of Paul and Silas, and then with Peter. And he seemed to have been the one to write down Peter's understanding of the gospel. Some even suggest these were the sermons of Peter that constitute the gospel. But Mark sought out challenges, even the kind of challenges that turned him 180 degrees away from life. The other part that comes clear both in the choosing of the disciples and in the stories of the community around whom Jesus worked and who responded to his risen status is this issue of community. So in the Gospel of Mark, we find strong messages of seeking out challenges that lead to change and a strong embracing of the nature of supportive community. I find that fascinating because when I read the literature that's now available on how learning takes place, whether it's at the kindergarten level or the graduate level or the post-secondary level, I find a remarkable convergence between this model of Mark and the early Christian community and what we're beginning to understand about the way in which you and I can learn and grow. Robert Theobald, an economist and futurist who's been an inspiration to me for two decades now, is writing basically a compendium of his life work. And the thesis of that book will be and is healthy people are people who are growing and helping others to grow. It seems to me that Mark, in his journeys with Paul and Silas and Peter, Mark, as he points out the words that were brought by Mary and Martha, is illustrating precisely what Robert Theobald is talking about in terms of how we grow and become healthy. The early church is punctuated by people who were challenged and in whose company they found a, com a community that was supportive to help them sort through and move forward in their growth. That's what learning theory is all about, that we read about for higher education these days. Learning takes place, growth takes place, when we seek out, or someone seeks us out, and challenges us, raises questions. But the growth also takes place when the other side of the coin is present, when there is a community of support with whom we sort things out and reconstruct and grow. As I celebrate with you then, Mark the Evangelist, I would celebrate with you the fundamental wisdom of the early church 
and the fundamental wisdom that we are rediscovering, whether we put language of epistemology on it or learning theory, that there is a convergence that we can celebrate here today with Mark and with Mary. Healthy people are persons who want to grow and want to help others to grow. And that will happen when there is challenge and there is support. Almost 12 years to this day, I signed a contract to come and teach at Augsburg College. My life has been marked in those 12 years by some very important Marks and Marys. One of the first people to take me aside was, may I stretch reality a bit, Marie Mary McNiff, who said, Gary, we need here in this setting to figure out ways to bring convergence between work and learning. Marie is probably very instrumental in my choosing five years ago to help start a co-op ed program. I rented a house and across the street was a woman named Mary Lou Williams. At that point, she was a regent. She was also a parent as we struggled together and I gained from what she had done on the north side of Minneapolis with others to build a growing community for children to learn in a racially integrated neighborhood. She loaned me a barbecue grill when Rick came over one night and didn't teach me how to use it and the fire went out in the middle of cooking chicken, but other than that, She's been a great catalyst in my life, as she has taught now with me. Mary Lou Da Silva, who came into our midst and was a catalyst for thought about developing countries, education, change, but also modeled community and collaboration. One of the first people I met when I came here was a Mark, a Mark Hansen, a pastor of a Northside church a graduate of Augsburg College. He performed the wedding for my wife and I. We became close as we worked on Northside political issues and a whole variety of things. But Mark brought into my life and my family's life frequent questions and challenges, both by the way he and his family lived, but by the way in which they modeled community and growth. Mark Ingebrigtsen approached me early and said, we need to do more interdisciplinary work and so he conned Ron Polisari and me into starting an integrated freshman program, which forced us to deal with issues and challenges that neither of us alone would probably have done with our schedules the way they were. Mark Davis and eight other men had been a men's group for several years before I arrived. They opened their lives to me, and for the past 12 years, I have had, since Mark is long gone, these other six men who have been on a weekly basis a chance to be challenged but a chance in which to be supported. Daily I work with two Marys, Lois and Susan. I work in a building full of people whose programs and lives bring challenges and stimulation as well as support. But perhaps and equally important are the students who have brought that challenge and support into my life, those Marys, those Marks. I came just 15 minutes ago from an independent study class that five students created because at their end of their senior year, they wanted to have a seminar that they would shape and form to try to struggle with the questions that they had been raising in their sociology major. They wanted to take charge of their education. They wanted to challenge each other and support each other as they sought to make sense of and to grow from their Augsburg education. Thirteen students have done research with me as colleagues, and each one of them has challenged me and raised questions and pushed the research in ways and directions it would never have gone. I stopped by as I walked over here, and the Global Center was meeting for its biennial board meeting, serving with that board for several years and watching the students who return from the Global Center programs in Cuernavaca, I know that it is those students who raise the questions of challenge, who become our colleagues, who with us struggle for community. 
And this semester, I have Jane Deere, who spoke just earlier last week, and Valerie Mack in a class, and as they wheel in in their chairs each week and each day for statistics, I am challenged and I am humbled by the sense of community they bring, the questions they raise, and by their very presence. We are a crucible of community. Mark and Mary invite us to embrace what has always been part of the Christian community, that interesting, tenuous balance between challenge, between conflict, and the kind of other ingredient of support and community. I would like to conclude in celebration of Mark and Mary with comments by Parker Palmer, who cuts to the heart for me of what not only higher education is about, but the church. Palmer writes, if you ask what holds community together and what makes this capacity for relatedness possible, the only honest answer I can give brings me to that dangerous realm called the spiritual. The only answer I can give is that thing that makes community possible, and that reality is love. I would like to think that love is not an entirely alien word in the academy today, because I know that in the great tradition of intellectual life, it is not. It is a word very much at home in the academy. The kind of community I am calling for is a community that exists at the heart of knowing, of epistemology, of teaching and learning, of pedagogy. That kind of community depends centrally on two ancient and honorable kinds of love. The first is love of learning itself, the simple ability to take sheer joy in having a new idea, reaffirming or discarding an old one, connecting two or more notions that hitherto seemed alien to each other, sheer joy in building images of reality with mere words that now suddenly seem more like mirrors of the truth. This is the love of learning. And the second kind of love on which this community depends is love among learners, of those we see every day who stumble and crumble, who wax hot and cold, who sometimes want truth and sometimes evade it at all costs but who are in our care and in whose care we are and who for their sake and ours and the world's deserve all the love that the community of teaching and learning has to offer. Let us pray. Dear God, as we sit here, we're in a safe warm place, a place that you have given us and blessed us with. We are privileged people. We are privileged to be in a community where your name is glorified and where we can turn questions inside out and ask and doubt and be affirmed. We know that we're only here so that we can reach out. And we pray that you would give us the wisdom, the strength, and the ability to do this. We thank you for the witness of those who have gone before us, who have made community in their lives and for the people they knew. And we pray that you would help us to do the same for those around us. We rejoice for the sound of the rain on the roof today. We rejoice because it reminds us that you are constantly with us, and you are with us not only when it rains, but in all the dry days as well. We thank you for your promise that you will always be with us. And we also thank you for the promise that you will be with us in pain and suffering. And we pray that you would be with Tom Geyer in a special way, as he is back in the hospital Help him not to be discouraged and frustrated and give him your healing power so that he too can be well again. 
as we go from this place, help us to be aware that we are yours and that nothing or no one can snatch us out of your hand. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We will sing the first and last stanzas of 499. Mighty, order our days and our deeds in peace. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.
We begin our worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have a slight problem, whereas, uh, actually, I think, if anybody needs a book, why don't you raise your hand this morning? That's the best way to handle this. Okay, you can share then. I guess we're okay. If uh, you uh, notice people coming in that need a book, uh, just go and share with them. My Lord, what a morning, number five. Please remain standing for the reading of the Gospel, which is from Luke 4, the 18th and 19th verses. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. You may be seated. 
We welcome today Kurt Paulson, Dr. Kurt Paulson, who is the new Associate Director of the Augsburg Institute for Youth and Family. The other Associate Director is his wife, Kathy. They have just recently moved here from Rapid City, South Dakota. They carry many impressive credentials with them, and we, we welcome them both. When I was growing up in the Danish tradition, we always had speeches after dinner, and we just got up at the table. And I never learned how to speak in front of a lectern, but here I am with one, so I'll make do. I'd like to tell you a quick story, one that you may or may not have heard of. It concerns a family, mother and dad, a couple of kids in high school. They lived on kind of a smallish farm, not one of these very technical farms that we see today. But it was a very total kind of farm. I think of the color green in the summer and white in the winter. It had a lushness about it. I think it was a mile or two from town, perhaps. And uh, one of the things, the, the operative terms about this farm was that you merged with it. You became one with it. The wood in the uh, grove of trees that was just to the west of the house uh, provided the wood for the fuel. And uh, I, I suppose that on afternoons off, and, and there were some in those days, the farmer would uh, go fishing in the brook that ran through the place. Always there seemed to be enough, never too much, but always enough, and they lived well. The kids seemed to enjoy it. And uh, the woman, and I might say we could say this story was either the farmer and his wife, or we could say... Uh, the farmer and her husband, however you'd like it to be. But the point was that they lived well. The other point, however, was that they didn't seem to know it. And one day, by chance, she saw, I suppose in something like a Better Homes and Gardens a magazine, the city. She had tasted something new and bigger and supposedly better. And supposedly about that same time, interestingly enough, a developer came by in his big car and he said he'd like to buy the farm. And having, having tasted this new way, this uh, city life, they said, well, why not? Let's sell it. And lo and behold, he offered them more money than they'd ever seen for a farm. And they took it and they moved to town. And they were thinking that, uh, of course, life was going to be even better. He settled into kind of a city job and she thought she might work too, so she worked. And then rather quickly, however, the entire family seemed to be a bit disillusioned. The consciousness that they now had, the awareness of their dissatisfaction that they now had, as opposed to the fact that they had not been aware of what they had on the farm, put them into a new state of awareness, and it hurt. And we noticed some things developing. He seemed to begin to work more. He'd go earlier and come later. And she kind of tolerated that. She too was unhappy. And we began to notice something with the kids. One of them started to study very hard, seemingly having to get A's in everything. And having to look very pretty. And eating poorly because she wanted to have a, a perfect body. And lo and behold, the other child was acting out. We call that in our business uh, raising cane. Not doing well, talking back to the teachers and so on. And then we see the phenomenon of the farmer began to stay later after work and he kind of liked to have a little nip, just a little bit to carry him through the evening. And gradually he began to come home later. And gradually we began to notice that the wife despaired and the kids did poorly. In college, I had a professor who always had a three-point lecture. I'd like to lay out three points about the farmer and his wife. First of all, that by moving into town, they had a new consciousness. They became aware of something that they hadn't been before. And they tried, by the way, to buy the place back. They went back to the developer and said, we realize that we have made a mistake. 
we would like to buy it back. And he said, well, I really rather like it here on your little farm, and the price has now gone ten times higher than you paid. Clearly out of reach for them. There was absolutely no way, none whatsoever, that they could do it by themselves. None. I suppose in many ways we are the farmer and his wife. We have experienced perhaps at some point our own Eden, and perhaps at some point not realized the good things we had. And at some point, I suspect, at least I know when I speak for me, that I bought something that was supposedly better and wished I had my previous life back. And the interesting paradox about this to me is without having left our farm, we wouldn't be in the position of knowing in this new state of consciousness that there was nothing by our own reason or strength that could get it back. And this seems to me to have kind of a two-sided notion to it. On the one hand, we wish it back, but on the other hand, we're thrust into a condition a new consciousness, a new awareness that says, no, we can't get it back. For a time, I've tried to play tricks like working harder, thinking that if I worked harder, that it would be okay. Or that if I got another good grade, it might be okay. Or that if I got another degree, it would be okay, or another car, or whatever. And I'm sure we all know what I'm talking about when we see people including me, having tried hard to avoid that new consciousness in the ways of the world. And yet, on the other hand, were we not thrust into this new awareness? And for me, that's the exciting point. If we were not thrust into this new awareness, we would then not be confronted with the fact, this great paradox that says, by our own reason or strength, we can't do it. But as it said in the scripture, the scripture this morning, if we forsake all and follow him, then not by our own reason or strength, but the power that we get from God he empowers us to do all things. We become weak, we leave the farm, we get a new awareness, and through that awareness, we also are empowered by God to relate to other people in ways that are sustaining and meaningful, and vital and healthy, in ways that eliminate the basic loneliness of all of us at various times. And I don't mean always, but that in those ways, by having become conscious of our own smallness, our own inability to get back to our own Eden, we are then so wonderfully and paradoxically empowered. It is, a, it is as though we have to live out the dialectic of being very frightened to have courage, to be very despairing to have hope. And that in the process of all of that, we begin to merge with our environment. That we lose the notion of subject-object. And that we become one with it in an entirely new way. And so, let us give thanks for our own Eden, perhaps even for our inability to be truly thankful for it because it's the crisis of stepping out of our Eden that brings us to our own Gethsemane. And in that process of sweating blood, in that process of knowing that even if we get another A this morning, another degree, another house, another new job, none of that will matter. That when we are on our knees, when we think of ourselves as the weakest, we have been empowered. 
to do those things that the farmer never realized could be done. But had he not left, and so let us not fear the crisis, let us not fear leaving our little farm. Had he not left, he would not have been empowered as he eventually came to be. Amen. May the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.
Let us pray. Lord, may the meditations of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. I'd like to take a moment at the beginning of this chapel to thank you for your prayers, especially prior to and associated with my recent surgery. The sense of support which I experienced, the sense of being born by the prayers of others, the sense of being remembered and cared for, has been overwhelming. I find it difficult to express the feelings that I have, so I would simply like to say that I'm grateful to God and to you for this community of faith. I've been reading recently a book titled The Words and the Word by Stephen Prickett, and the impetus for this talk and some of its substance are attributable but not blamable to Stephen Prickett. Early on, the author calls attention to the story of Elijah as it is given to us in the authorized version of 1611 in 1 Kings. The authorized version is what we know and remember as the King James Version. And I'm going to read that text from that version. And he, that is, Elijah, arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. We're going to come back to it, but that last phrase, a thin, small voice, Stephen Prickett says, can be more appropriately translated as a voice of thin silence. The story is a familiar one. And because it is familiar, we're likely to miss some of its essential features. The author to whom I referred, for example, asks, what was the fire? What was the wind? Was there an electrical storm? Were the wind and the fire connected? Were the wind and the fire connected with the earthquake? Were these events external to Elijah, or were they internal to him? Are they the expressions of the turmoil of his mind? There is no answer to these and similar questions. For the center of the story is Elijah's encounter with God. Many of you will recall another story of Elijah namely his encounter with the prophets of Baal. In 1 Kings, in 1 Kings, Elijah's encounter with the prophets of Baal precedes almost immediately the text I have just read. In that contest on Mount Carmel, Yahweh 
demonstrated his superiority over Baal. A sacrifice was prepared, and the prophets of Baal summoned Baal, importuned him, cried out to him to accept the sacrifice and burn it up, but nothing happened.